Hello and welcome to part 6 of my deconstruction of Bernardo Castro slash Essentia Foundation's course on analytic idealism. And uh, we are kicking off from around 13 minutes and 12 seconds where we left off uh, last time. So let's see what, uh, <laughs> what we will be enlightened about. Physics cannot observe the world as it is in itself. It only has access to perception. Even if we use instrumentation, we only... And so does philosophers. You also only have access to perception, right? If, if those who... Uh, when you do science, let's say, right? Why would you limit your access to that world you're trying to describe by saying, I'm only going to do this, right? There's no extra thing that a philosopher or some, somebody attempting to do philosophy can sort of tap into. It's the same thing, right? There are experiences or qualia and there are uh, conceptualizations like elephant and other kind of abstractions like, you know, um, uh, sci um, yeah, science is actually a, an abstraction, right? Uh, it's not a concept. So it's like... Uh, that, that's what you have to work with. It's not like because you're doing philosophy, all of a sudden you have access to something that you, that, then you, that you can then explain metaphysics with, or physics for that matter, right? No, it's, it's the same thing. Basically, I would say the skeptical approach, right, to, um, to metaphysics is metaphysics cannot explain anything. All you can do is be as rigid in how you approach your experience, right? And not try to go beyond what you can actually be founded on, right? Which is a reduction base. A reduction base you cannot explain. So it's like he, he, he attempts to impregnate you with these terms that makes you, that sort of grooms you towards thinking that he, he has some kind of special access, like Jesus can talk to God and whatever, right? Uh, it's bullshit. It's just pure bullshit. Philosophers have no, uh, you know, special access to anything that somebody doing science have, right? Science just deals only with what you can sort of objectify, right? And how it moves about. So there is a usefulness in that, but there is also a step of indirection. Physics is a science of perception, of the dashboard, not a science of the world as it is in itself. So this is all... No, because, and that's what is brilliant about science. It doesn't go deeper than it can go, right? You're thinking that you sort of can penetrate this wall of perception by, you know just juggling words around is a fallacy of the highest order, right? It's a, it's a, a brain fart of uh, monumental proportions, right? You can't do that, right? You can't go on behind that which becomes the experience because it has to be an experience before you can have any access to it, right? And if it's an experience, then it's not the thing itself, as Immanuel Kant would say. So you're constantly pushing this, you're making, trying to create some sort of smokescreen and, and, and uh, fog of war or, or, you know, gray area where you sort of, oh, pop, oh, I'm on the other side. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not buying that at all. It tries to make sense of those three facts that we saw in the very beginning, these three uh, undeniable observations. So matter is a theoretical abstraction to try to make sense of these. When you're writing in the first paragraph, it seems like that's not a good argument. If, if you sort of all already stepping into it's undeniable. We are going from it seems like until it's undeniable. It's sort of a step you have made without explaining how within a few seconds here, right? Uh, I'm not buying that, right? I'm not buying it. These observations, but matter itself is not a given. Uh, it is not an empirically... Matter is an abstraction, as you have stated earlier yourself. 
Why are you dealing with abstractions at this point if you haven't clarified what your reduction base is, right? So it's like you're working from abstractions and then from the abstractions you're going to at some point, uh, I suppose, state some kind of reduction base. Well, you are, you are turning it around. You are, you are, you're working in the wrong direction, right? You should start with the reduction base, establish that, and then work on top of that, in my opinion, using only axioms until you get to, ha, until you have established uh, metaphysics. And from then on, you can make definitions, for instance, of what you mean by knowledge, right? I can observe this bottle top. No, but it's just another word. I'm just sticking a label onto it and saying matter. The word matter doesn't explain anything. It's just a word, right? It doesn't, if I'm having some, you know, this bottle, whatever it is, he's holding, uh, this hand has particular color and shape and, and, and smell and <laughs> it doesn't smell, but <laughs> taste and so on, right? And, and sound, right? So just calling it matter doesn't add anything to the reduction base, right? So it, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. Matter is just a term uh, that, that is, um, basically something that is used to clarify what can be influenced by gravity, I would say, right? If it can't be influenced by gravity, it's not matter, right? So it's a big category of all those things that have particular uh, qualia that also is influenced or creates gravity, right? That definition I just made, that would actually be some kind of definition of matter, right? But that's not what you do when you're doing metaphysics. Then you're trying to clarify your reduction base and how many steps you need to, how many axioms you need to state in order to get to start to do epistemology, right? So uh, matter is an abstraction of some kind from some point in your philosophy. And it's, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not important to discuss matter in metaphysics, right? Because it's a term that is used on a, in another part of your philosophy, something about describing the world, right? Which is basically some kind of, uh, at least some relation to science, right? Why would, you, why would you, if you go down to the grocery store, you don't go around thinking about matter, do you, right? You know, does that have matter? Uh, do, do you test it whether or not it falls to the floor or something like that? No, you don't. You have already conceptualized your world. You don't need to talk about matter in order to get around, right? So I'm not really interested in matter as a concept in this connection here, right? The empirical givens. So let's start from those. Let's take this theoretical... No, there's nothing that is called empirical given. There's nothing that is given to you. There is no... Oh. You are implying that something beyond your experience is giving something to you. It's like, okay, you, you must have this rather than this. It's given to you because it's important or something like that. You are, you are applying some kind of importance to your experience that you haven't clarified why you're all of a sudden referring to some kind of importance, right? You can say that your experience as a total is important because that's what have been left over from, uh, you know, millions of years of evolution, which is also some kind of, you know, uh, axiom that, 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 that has been influencing uh, your being or your experience as such, right? Um, that is, it's important because that's what left, but we are not talking about the whole of experience as such. We are starting to go into cl classifying particular aspects as far as I can hear, right? So there is nothing that you can point to within your experience as being important rather than something else, unless you state it in some kind of axiom that this is what is important and this is less important I'm basing on these ideas and understandings, and this is my axiom, right? You can't just throw a word at it and think that, that you have done some philosophy around it, right? 
uh, it keeps you keep arguing in this fashion. I'm, I don't find it very solid at all. I find it extremely fluffy, right? And try to go about it in a different way. That's what this slide's trying to do. It's trying to start from solid ground, not from solid ground. Okay, I like that. Please tell me what that solid ground is. Theoretical assumptions that we have inherited from previous generations rather uncritically. So what is safe to say? It is safe to say that there is experience. That's nature's given. Before we start theorizing, we experience. If we did not have any, any experience, there would be exactly nothing as far as we are concerned. Since we are here talking about it, there is something, therefore there is experience. And then, per force, there is an ex. Yeah, there is experience, but you only have your experience. When you're talking about we, you're saying that there are more of the same kind as me out there. But your version of that out there is an experiential one. That's not your experience. Those objects that might have a similar experience, but you don't have access to that experience. And I would uh, absolutely believe that you you would say the same thing, right? Be the problem over the minds um, and being disconnected from that outside, right? So since there is experience, you it's a it, this is an axiom, right? Since you should say, since I have experience, I will make the axiom that I extend that to other, let's say, what I consider beings in my experience having the same kind of experience, right? You are saying that I know there's a problem of other minds, but I'm going with the axiom that these other minds have a similar kind of experience as me on which we potentially further down the line can agree upon, right? Or disagree upon, right? Experience, sir. There is the subject of experience. Now, throughout this module... Yes, and that's what I think you would call meta-consciousness, right? I have an experience and I have some kind of awareness of that experience. And you could also say that awareness is actually my conceptualizations and my abstractions, my inductions, whatever I do with it, right? Whatever I do with this experience is a kind of awareness which is purely uh, something that is subjective, you could say, right? But that also, in, in, in some way, you have to axiomize that also with regards to other individuals, in my opinion, right? This means if, if there's an experience and an experiencer or some, something or someone, subject, being aware of that experience, it's very close to saying there's something else that then experience that is aware of my experience. So it's sort of dualist, right? It's not another experience being aware of experience. I don't think that would work, right? That's, that's saying that experience can be aware of experience or something like that. That sounds like bullshit, right? So in my opinion, the experience, you don't have any access to what is behind experience. But you neither have uh, uh, insight into what is behind ex this experiencer, right? The, your awareness, but what happens behind your awareness, you're not aware of. And that is possibly one of the problems with l something like the free will, right? That goes on deeper down in levels of your experiencer that you do not have direct access to, right? We understand the word in language, experience, requires the existence of an experiencer. It is uh, literally meaningless to talk of experience without some form of experiencer, some form of that to which the experience is given. No, no, no. no. Not the word given, please. Given? It's sort of, you're handed some particular, you know, you should, this is how it should be experienced. This is what it is. We have the whole shelf of things, but this is what is given to you because that's 
No, no, no. You are you are imbuing your understanding with a selection or classifying as already being important information of some kind that should be understood in a certain way. No, it doesn't follow. A color doesn't have some uh, your manual, right? Neither does a smell or a taste or a sound, right? It doesn't come with any manual, right? Just because you have a, an experience or let's say, as I would, something, something that is aware of it, doesn't make it information just like that, right? There's nothing in it that makes it information and you can't go somewhere else and say, I'm, I, wait a minute, uh, yes, yes, I know there's qualia there, but just hang on, I'm checking with you know, my, my information guide over here and say, that's information, that's information. It doesn't work that way, right? And you might misunderstand what I'm trying to get at here, but, but this is also a fallacy within metaphysics that is sort of given to you, right? It's sort of a, a, a benevolent version of the evil demon of Descartes, right? It sort of it doesn't it's not trying to trick you but it's trying to help you right <laughs> so there's nothing there you can say it, it i mean i can't say it's it's not given to you right i can't say that something else i can't refute the demon right because it's beyond my experience but that doesn't mean i can either say there isn't a demon or there is a demon i can say it's unknowable right as i'm said before and because it's unknowable, there's no way to classify your experience in a certain way compared to some other kind of experience just from the ground floor. That's why you need to make some kind of axiom about how you approach this without having any preconceived idea of what it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to be understood. And the term you use, given, is a sort of Freudian slip that tells me that you have already some preconceived idea of how it's supposed to be understood. Brain function is a perceptual experience. If brain function had, had never been perceived... Brain function is a, an abstraction, right? Now you're going into abstractions. You are jumping out of your reduction base now, right? Don't do that. If by someone, we wouldn't be talking of a brain function. The neuroscientist perceives the output of a function. Don't talk about neuroscience. You need to classify an idea of knowledge before you can do science. Don't talk about science when you do metaphysics. You're all over the place, man, right? Functional MRI. Uh, the psychiatrist perceives. <laughs> We're doing it psychiatry. Don't talk about psychiatry in metaphysics, man, right? the traces that are produced by an, e, by an EEG or an MEG. So every time or, or, or the neurosurgeon perceives uh, uh, the dilation of the brain capillaries as he's doing brain surgery, which correlate with brain activity. So whatever else it may or may not be, what we uh, uh, call brain function is certainly a perceptual experience. Somebody perceives something that uh, they call brain function. Uh, I might add that the slide he's showing uh, at the moment, uh, it says, so let us start from incontrovertible observations, not explanatory models. So incontrovertible observations. Uh, he hasn't uh, clarified that what an observation is. He hasn't clarified what does it mean that is incontrovertible, right? Um, and then point one is, since there is experience, there is an experiencer. He has uh, talked about that, right? Whatever else it may be, brain function is a perceptual experience. No, it isn't. It's an abstraction. What color does brain function have? What sound does... Does brain function have a color? Yes or no? Does brain function have a sound? Yes or no? Does brain function have a taste? Does it have a feel? Does it have a smell? Neither of these. So it can't be perceived. It can only be an idea, an abstraction, something. You are, you are creating from inside your mind, right? Rather than coming through uh, empirical experience, right? So you're already, um, you know, showing that you do not understand the basics here. 
The point three is the brain is made of what we will what we call matter, just like the rest of the perceived universe. But you don't perceive matter. You you said that it's an it's an abstraction, so you can't perceive. Well, what are you doing, man? Am I confused here? Didn't you just say that matter is an abstraction, and now you're talking about it? It's the brain is made of what we call matter, just like the rest of the perceived universe. So matter must be perceivable or perceptible. But you just told me it's an abstraction, a model. So you're you're contradicting your own statements here. I mean, if this is your attempt at making some kind of uh, axioms or something along those lines, definitions or whatever you want to call it, and still jumping around... Uh, tapping into or going out of some kind of idea of an abduction base. This is extremely fluffy, right? This is not going to crack it, mate, right? It has to be more rigid than this. Oh, I, I might add that there's a picture of a sort of a um, a skull or a, a what's it called? Um, uh, X-ray picture of a skull with sort of a picture of a, a, a field of um poppies uh green field with red poppies on right and the sky inside the sort of brain area of that x-ray scan for instance this bottle top here is made of matter by what do you mean yeah, that's an abstraction that's a model or whatever term you're using right you you had you don't have a matter sense that you don't have a sixth sense that says, ah, I'm experiencing matter, right? No, you have the sense qualia. And from that you say, okay, I'm going to classify this particular qualia or set of qualia as matter, right? You have to understand the difference between abstracting or objectifying or model modeling and having actual qualia, right? Because all the other things I mentioned, you know, the abstraction and, and conceptualizations, or objectifications, and whatever models, they are all derived from the qualia, some way or another, right? So the qualia is the, the foundation. Uh, but using the word matter colloquially only re refers to the... And he is also using the term like exist, right? You need to define what that is. You are doing foundational metaphysics here, right? You have to be sharp on the terms used. You can't just throw them out there. Uh, you have to state how you understand them. I might have an understanding of what it means to exist, but that might not be the same as yours. So if I think I'm having the same uh, understanding of existence as you have, and your, uh, your understanding is different because you haven't, and I don't know that because you haven't defined it, but then we are talking past each other, right? So you have an obligation to state your terms used and what you mean by them. So from this point on, every time you see me using the word matter, I will be using it colloquially, because it's just silly to deny the existence of that which we ordinarily and colloquially call matter. In other words... Just because we call an aspect of our experience something doesn't mean we have to pretend that it exists just on that ground, right? It's like you're saying, but there are so many people who want there to be matter, so I guess we have to uh, say that it exists. What kind of bullshit philosophy is that? Right? It's sort of a bandwagon argument, which is, by the way, a fallacy, right? The contents of perception. So matter exists as that, but it doesn't exist as conceptually defined under mainstream physicalism, as we've discussed. Okay, so how do you... Uh, define this matter, or which must be some kind of existence. How do you get to that existence of matter, right? How can I experience matter? If you're saying it has a color, and it has a shape, and it has a taste, well, you're just referring to the, to, to the qualia, right? And then, then, you know, just throwing out a word called matter. It doesn't work. It has to fit with the reduction base, right? whatever what we call matter is. So there is this kinship <laughs> between what we call a brain and... So because somebody in your prior life told you there's something called matter, you have to say, okay, I guess that I have to have that in my philosophy and all, everything in the universe is underlined by this matter. 
but you're not going to tell me how you get to it, right? You're not, you're not going to tell me how you get from your experience, your qualia, to this matter, right? You haven't, you haven't explained that yet, right? The rest of the universe, both seem to be made of the same. So now you're talking about the rest of the universe. That's a pretty big one, right? Have you been on the other side of Pluto and, you know, whatever, right? So it's, you're just sort of, okay, I guess I've heard about matter and it's everywhere, right? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a pretty huge step, right? It's, a pretty, it's just saying, well, everything is matter. So uh, done, I've done it. It's perfect. Right, so these are three solid facts. They are not theory-laden. Facts? Facts? <laughs> facts? You're not doing epistemology, mate, right? Facts are something you can refer to using knowledge, right? If I say that's an elephant, right? I can see, and, 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 and you say, oh, I, if I, that's true to me, otherwise yeah, I could be lying. But if I experience elephant, right? I could make a proposition, say that's an elephant, and that would be true to me. But nevertheless, the fact would be elephant, right? The fact would be elephant, but that's on the other side of epistemology. We're doing metaphysics here. You can't have facts in metaphysics because metaphysics is what needs to be established in order to get to an understanding what a fact is. Oh man, this is bad, right? I'm actually surprised how bad it is, right? Oh man. We can have high confidence in these three facts and the three observations. We can have high confidence? Don't tell me what I can have. Oh, hey, you should have high confidence because this is a superior hypothesis, right? I'm using term and true and, and um, terms like um, fact and, and hypotheses about an area of philosophy where they have nothing to do, right? You shouldn't be use, using these terms in, in metaphysics, right? It's, like, it's, it's, it's a bunch of bullshit, man. God, it's bad, man. I am actually <laughs> surprised how bad it is. Oh, my God. Uh, theoretical conclusions that are uh, solid and safe and not dependent. Solid and safe? You're just throwing words at it. And you're throwing words at me like that sounds like, oh, it's solid. Uh, you know, but throwing words at me until I say, oh, I guess he's right because he, is, uh, he has two PhDs, so he must be right, right? I'm just too stupid to understand this. So he says it's solid and it, it's cohesive and all, all these words. So I guess it is because he says so. <laughs> what a piece of crap philosophy, man. Oh, it's bad. And... You know, if, if it was some kind of uh, amateur philosopher who's trying his best to do some metaphysics, well, okay, I would be more gentle, right? I would be more gentle. But he's fucking claiming this is a superior hypothesis that is the only one in the universe that is actually functioning. Everything else is bullshit, right? And then he pulls stupid lingo like this in order to class can construct a hypothesis. When you even can't use the term hypothesis about metaphysics, man. I mean, and he has two PhD, one in science and one in philosophy. Get the frick out of here, man, right? Why have you spent other people's money on getting PhDs if you can't even do it? Do these simple things in a rigid manner, right? Oh, Ugh. Okay, the next slide that popped up is the same picture. Uh, the title is, what's the simplest interpretation of these observations? Well, the simplest might not actually necessarily be the correct one, right? Just because it's the simple, it, it shouldn't be the most complicated one. That's what Occam Razor would say on, you know, a, a parsimonious attitude towards a reduction base. But it's not necessarily the simplest one that is the right one, right? It can become too simple, right? Well, 
there's no reason to think that it's necessarily the simplest one that is the correct one. It might be the third simplest one that is actually the correct one. And the simplest and the second simplest one are actually too simple to explain what you think you are trying to explain, to stay with your term explain, right? Okay, point one or bullet one is experience is an excitation of the experiencer, of the experiencer. What's an excitation? You're just calling your uh, your awareness an excitation. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm bringing in the word awareness, right? So let's, okay, fair enough. I have to really grab my own tits here, right? So when it, what he calls excitation is my awareness, what I would call awareness, right? Like ripples of water or the dance of the dancer. How poetic. The ripples. Oh, it sounds, oh man, and this for, is this for the lady audience, right? The ripples on the water. It's so beautiful. Uh, dance of the dancer. Oh, oh, ballroom blitz. Ballroom blitz. Blitz, blitz, ballroom blitz. <laughs> oh, sorry. There are two experiential perspectives. Intrinsic brain function and intrinsic inner life, but both are experiences. Okay, I'll take that one again. There are two experiential perspectives. But if it's a perspective, there must be a third one having those two experiences. Otherwise, I mean, you can't experience the experiencer. Otherwise, you will have to have a third entity called the experience, experiencer, experiencer, right? And what, how would you then get to the experiencer of the experiencer of the experiencer? And now you're going into some kind of infinite regression in an infinite number of experiences, right? But both are experiences. So you are you are saying you are experiencing you are, you are having as an experiencer you have an experience of two different experiences of which one of them is the experiencer. What I mean, ugh, my brain explodes, right? Oh. The bullet free is the brain and its function are the extrinsic appearance of conscious inner life. Inner life. What is inner life? Why do you need to talk about the brain? Brain can only be some kind of abstraction or conceptualization based on qualia. You can't go into objectification at this point. You need to establish that reduction base, right? So you can't talk about abstractions in the, in this scenario. It just it's all over the place this month. I can't believe how bad it is, right? To begin with, we have to avoid any fundamental ontological distinction between experience and experiencer. Why? Because if we made an ontological distinction between the two, we would run into all kinds of problems. Okay. Namely, how can the experience relate to the experiencer? How does the experience the experiencer feel the experience if the feel why do we need to you know, feel is some kind of qualia that there's nothing that says why can't the experience be in direct connection with the awareness why can't if if the what is behind experience is in direct connection with your experience behind your experience why can't your awareness of it be in direct connection with that screen of experience from the other side. Why is that a problem? Are you afraid that you're going to run into this kind of dualism? I pointed out before, if you say that the, that the um, experiencer, to stay with your term, is of a different kind that you experience, then you run into the problem of trying, you're having to explain what that different thing is, right? So you want to keep in a singularity here, there's only one kind. It already reeks of, this is going to be, there's only one kind of thing, and therefore I can tell you what it is. And that one kind of thing I'm going to extend to the other side of your experience, because then I'm not bringing in new stuff into dualism on the other side, right? To avoid the mind-body problem. 
So, an experience is a excitation of the experiencer. An excitation. But is excitation also an experience, right? If there's experience and experience, what is an excitation? And what does that excitation, right? Is that from the outside of the, the experience appear arrived from the outside? So the experiencer is also arriving from the outside or what? But from the other side? Or what? <laughs> from another side, from another realm? I mean, I... What are you saying, man? I mean, it's so already so confusing that it's it's just a brain, f f f you know, fart this, right? Just terms everywhere. No, nothing is defined. I'm just uh, saying excitations. And uh, it's like, get the fuck out of here, man, right? This is so disappointing, right? In the same way that ripples are an excitation of water. Or so they're little ripples? Your experience is a little ripple thing. But I'm the, I don't have ex, uh, access to your experiences. I certainly do not have access to your experience, right? According to you, I must have access to my experience. But I, can, I have no idea about any ripples anywhere or any excitations anywhere. I can say I have some kind of awareness and I would classify that as my conceptualizations and my abstractions. And, uh, you know, objectifications like uh, uh, cow or bicycle or, you know, flower or whatever, right? That's what I'm aware of in my experience. In my opinion, you need that awareness in order to give some sense to your qualia experience, right? But there's nothing, nothing in the awareness that tells me that it should be there. The, my mind has created an awareness and put it on the qualia, so to say. Put on the qualia, say, that's an elephant, right? It, I don't know if that's an elephant. I'm on the experience side, right? How do I know if I should or shouldn't experience elephant? I have no way of judging that. I can only say, I guess I'm experiencing elephant. And I guess I'm going to take it seriously, right? And I'm also actually going to take it literally, right? I'm going to say, that's an elephant, because that's what I have access to. Am I going to fuck it, flee from it, fight it, or feed on it, right? Or that a dance, a choreography, is an excitation of the dancer. There is nothing to the dance, but the dancer in movement, in excitation. There yeah, if I uh, showed you jumping around here, would you say that would be dancing? If I'm doing this, is that dancing? How do you know? If I do this... Is that dancing? Am I dancing now? Do I have to stand up? I can't sit, uh, sit dance. If I do this, is that dancing? Uh, you know. <laughs> What's uh, did that, uh, you know, pop fiction? Um, <laughs> is that dance? What is a dance? Well, it's your interpretation of it, right? It's an interpretation. And if you say it's a dance, well, I, I'm saying that's not a dance. Well, who's right? Well, we both are or none of us are, right? It's up to you to, to judge whether or not you think it's a dance. But that's not a part of the dancer, right? It's your interpretation of what the hell is going on. You've just been sort of trained to say when they do this, it's called a dance. And when you say dance, people have an idea of what you're talking about. You're possibly talking about some people moving around in some particular fashion, rather than, you know, uh, you know, jumping from a cliff or something like, right? But there's nothing in that going on that necessitates an abstraction called dancing, right? And that's because it's something that is only a part of your objectification of the world, or an abstraction from the world, right? depending on what term you want to put on it. There is nothing to ripples but the water in which they ripple. There is nothing to ripples but water in movement, in excitation. Who gives a flying freak about water, right? You don't experience water. You experience the thing that you call water, right? So if you say a, an objectification called water, okay, it has a certain pattern, so what? Right? It doesn't mean that that pattern is so suddenly something that is going on behind your experience on, of which you use 
in order to be an experiencer of that experience. You're just creating sort of conceptualizations that are sufficiently abstract from everyday life. So like ripples, I could say, right? But you know, ripples are there are ripples many places in in your sheet or in water or in air, you know, whatever, radio waves, whatever, right? So it sounds like it's something that could be everywhere, like, you know, a gravitational field or or electromagnetism, sort of everywhere there's waves, or sort of, oh, it sort of uh, gets behind you, so it's trying to manipulate you into some kind of understanding of some woo-woo shit about waves uh, uh, in the back of your mind, ex exciting, and therefore you are aware of the colors of... Oh, man, right? This is going to be a long haul, I think. <laughs> <laughs> to get through this one and a half hour. Oh. In exactly the same way, my proposal is there is nothing to the experience but an excitation of the experience, sir. So the only thing that has standalone existence is the experience, sir. Experience can be reduced to the experiencer. Or in a but they were still two kinds of experience, weren't they? You just said that in maybe in the earlier slide that they are both experiences. There, there are two experiential perspectives, extrinsic and intrinsic. Okay, these are just words, right? Experiential perspective. Well, what, what is that? Is an experiential perspective the same as an experience? I wouldn't think so. But what then? Then what are they? Is the experiencer also an experience? And the experience is an experience. Aren't you violating the idea of experience here? Right? Just, you know, sort of categorizing, uh, putting terms on them in order to sort of give me some kind of notion of a weird experiencer that isn't really there, but it's an excitation or a ripple or a dancer, you know. Oh! And this is a very handy starting point. Okay, so there's an experiencer. Why is the experiencer there if, if the experience itself all of a sudden isn't that important? So you're going to explain the experience through some excitation called the experiencer. So it's a, two kinds of experiences. One of them has excitations, and that's why it's aware of the other experience. But... I have no way of checking what the hell you're talking about. I'm not experiencing any ripples or any excitations, right? These are just terms you have brought in from the left without telling me. You're just sticking them on them, right? Sticking on my awareness or my experiencer, right? It, you're, not, you're not clarifying. You, you're just bringing in new terms and saying, well, I'm sticking this here and I'm sticking that there and I have explained something. No, you haven't. You haven't. You haven't explained fuck all, man. You have explained nothing. And by the way, you can't explain metaphysics. That's another thing I've talked about, right? But what are you explaining? You're just saying, I think I'm going with this. And I think it's superior. <laughs> I'm not buying it. Okay, we are at 2419. And I think uh, we will call it a day for now and say see you in the next one.